Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, just as a reminder, if you're on the end of a row and you've got a spare seat next to you, just shuffle in. I know that there's heaps of space right now, but um, just to get in the habit of doing it for later sessions. So we've got Mino and Claire from the Cacophony Project. Give them a big round of applause. This is uh, perhaps what Chris in New Zealand used to sound like. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, a lot of New Zealand doesn't sound like this anymore. And um, we're trying to do something about it. So uh, we're the Cacophony Project, well, we're part of the Cacophony Project. And so we're an open source startup. Um, we're all about trying to increase the bird song in, in New Zealand. And we're using modern IT to, to get that done. Uh, which is a bit quite different from the, um, we're interested in increasing the, the volume of birdsong and also the variety of birdsong because those two things are, are really good indicators that the bird populations are, are doing well, are getting better. And um, we're open source and we're a startup and we'll talk a bit more about that. So open source, we're, we're open source and we're actually a charity, we're, we're non-profit. So we're very much focused on the problem, solving this issue. Uh, of introduced predators in New Zealand that are, are having a big impact on, on New Zealand's birds. Um, we, uh, we share our ideas and our code, so uh, everything we do, our hardware designs, our software is all completely open source and available for anyone to look at, to contribute to. And we regularly blog and talk at conferences uh, about what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're very much open to working with other organizations and we do that all the time. So um, when we are lacking in a certain bit of expertise, whether it's weatherproofing our hardware or uh, something with machine learning that we, we're struggling with, we, 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 we often work with other people, other organizations. And of course, we encourage contributions. And we, we now have a, a really good uh, set of uh, people who volunteer their time regularly uh, to improving our code. We've got designers, we've got hardware experts, we've got um, you know, develop, web developers, embedded systems developers. It's, it's really awesome. We're also very much a startup, so uh, we, we have a vision of where we want to be. We, we don't quite know how we're going to get there, but we're trying lots of things and we're failing fast all the time. We're, we, it's very iterative, iterative. We're constantly trying out of something, falling back to plan B, falling back to plan C. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's very much the way we're operating at the moment. So why is it important to, uh, to solve this issue? Well. But the New Zealand's native birds are, are, are taonga, which is our, they're a native uh, sort of natural treasure. And um, they're, they're very unique birds. They're, they're quite different from uh, birds elsewhere in the world. They evolved separately from uh, the rest of the world, uh, and they evolved without mammals. So the mammals that have been introduced into New Zealand, um, from Australia and from Europe, um, are having a, a great time because the birds here have no defenses against the mammals. A lot of them have become flightless because there was no reason to fly anymore. Um, so they really need our help. In New Zealand, we're currently spending over $70 million a year on controlling pests, uh, these introduced pests. And those management strategies do work, but uh, they only suppress numbers. They never get them down to zero. So what we're trying to do is, is, is something beyond the, the current status quo to see if we can avoid this recurring cost all the time. And there's also benefits to agriculture. Possums in particular are vectors for tuberculosis, which can transmit quite well to, to livestock. Um, so that's another reason why we, we want to get on top of this problem. So what's the current state of the art when dealing with, with in, in, introduced predators? Well, uh, you've, you've got to see a picture there of a, what's called a chew card, which is a, just a piece of plastic with some, some, some sort of bait in, in, in it. It's, uh, the idea is that you leave it stuck to a tree somewhere, the white sort of attracts them as well as the bait. Rats and possums and, and stoats, if they're interested, they'll chew on it. And you come back later and you look at the card and you go, ooh, we've got some rats or we've got some stoats. Or, ooh, I'm not sure what that was. And you, it's pretty, pr pretty primitive. And if there's lots of other food around, animals will just ignore them. So, we, it's not a great way of, of knowing what's around. It gives you some idea, but it it's, doesn't work too well. In terms of eliminating predators, um, a common approach is if you've been to a walk anywhere in New Zealand, you'll have seen these boxes everywhere. 
uh, their traps. Um, those traps uh, do work, but um, studies have shown, and we've certainly seen it in our own, own experience, that less than sort of 1% of an animals that walk near a trap actually interact with it, which is a really low rate. So um, it's not ideal. And a lot of the traps are, are handicapped intentionally in their design because they're trying to only catch the animals we want to, we want to catch without getting other animals in there. And so they intentionally don't work as well as they might otherwise because we're worried about catching a bird or something else in there. So we're all about looking for something that's a whole lot better, that's radically better than the current status quo. And we, we think that uh, digital technology might be the, the answer. So we'll talk a little bit about what we're actually doing. But to give you an idea, uh, one of our devices could, a single device could cover 100 times the area of a single um, a, a conventional trap, the, the traps that we use these days. It could catch multiple types of animals, so at least four ty different types of pests, uh, instead of the current traps, which are generally geared to one animal. So if you're, you've got different pests in a given area, you've got to deploy all these different types of traps and manage those. And it could catch animals at least 10 times as often as, as a, when an a animal comes near a trap. And um, they can catch things multiple times. They don't need a human to go out there every time a trap's gone off to clear a trap. So it could be over 4,000 times more effective than the current approaches. So we've, uh, we've built this uh, ecosystem of, of technologies which work together. And this is a bit of a picture of, of what, what we have at the moment. So on the bottom right, we've, we've got our audio recorder. That's uh, where the project started. That's all about quantifying birdsong to see how we're doing. Uh, when we're, we're trying to manage these pests. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that soon. We've got our thermal video platform, which is an embedded a device with a thermal, um, a thermal camera, which we'll do a little bit of a demo of. Um, it's got a computer on board. It's reasonably powerful. Uh, we've got an application called Sidekick, which can be used to manage that uh, those devices when they're out in the field. And then we've got a whole bunch of stuff in the cloud. And the most important part maybe is our API server where all the recordings and data gets, re uh, gets kept. Uh, and then that, that uh, feeds our machine learning pipeline, our web application for accessing those recordings. And we'll get into a lot of that throughout the talk today. So the audio recorder, that's that first thing that was on the bottom left. Um, we call it the cacophonometer. <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple Android mobile phone, and it's uh, all about providing a cheap, easy to deploy way of uh, measuring birdsong at intervals throughout the day over time. So it would wake up once an hour, make a short recording, upload that recording to our API server where it can be analyzed. Um, the idea is you can deploy these all over the place and get a, over time, get a good idea of, of whether birdsong is increasing or decreasing. And we've also got people who are starting to look into actually identifying bird species in, in those recordings as well, uh, using machine learning. But uh, right now, we're really in a phase of getting these things out there and just gathering that data. And once we have the data, people can start doing interesting things with it. Our uh, thermal video uh, system, uh, is, that picture there is actually uh, quite old. It's a very early prototype, but uh, it's a slightly newer one here. Um, it, uh, it doesn't look like much. It's a very much a prototype, but it's uh, got a, quite a good thermal camera in it. It's got a Raspberry Pi. We'll talk a little bit more about what, what it can do. And the, the reason we use thermal video is that our, the animals we're interested in seeing are mainly active at night, and they're all nice and warm. So they, they, they show up really nicely against the, the cool night background. So uh, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things we can see with our cameras. Hopefully works. Yes. Right. So that's uh, a bird narrowly escaping a cat. Um, you can see that our machine learning uh, system is classified as a possum because at that point it hadn't been trained about cats. So the closest is a possum, which is a reasonable guess. And um, now we're just going to do a, a little live demo. The demo gods play nicely. All right, so we have, uh, here we go, awesome. So this is, this is 
the audience. Now, this, the frame rate on this is pretty slow because it's coming through our web interface, which does turn it down a little bit. It does actually read faster, but you can get an idea of, um, <laughs> nice, and close up, there's my hand. So you can see that unlike conventional footage, it, it, it's, it's really focused, it's all about heat. It's all, so um, the warmer parts of us, which you know, are the most, more exposed parts of us, uh, are you know, highlighted in, as brighter colors. And um, the darker stuff, so if you're wearing a really well insulated thermal sort of um, jacket, you almost look invisible from, from the neck down. So there we go. All right, so that's, this is actually our, um, a little web server which is running on the device here, and we use it when we're deploying the f them out in the field so we can actually see exactly where the camera's pointing before we walk away, so we make sure it's in the right place. All right, so what's actually inside there? So, um, the basic parts are, there's a, there's a Raspberry Pi hiding underneath, uh, there's a, a, uh, some custom electronics on top, which we call, it's called a hat, which we can talk about in a second. Um, there's a 4G or 3G modem data stick for connectivity to the internet, for, for use for uploading recordings and software updates and things like that. The very important camera, which is the main feature up there, is, is in the top there. It's actually tiny, it's, it's mounted um, inside a little 3D printed um, holder there, but it, it's, it's very small. And then it's all wrapped up in a um, waterproof enclosure. Uh, all the connectors are, are, are weatherproof. And we also have a gore valve down there, which I'll, I'll talk about what that is uh, a little bit later on. But yeah, it's a little embedded system. So that, the custom electronics on top, um, there's a few extra things that the Raspberry Pi doesn't give us. So we have to add them ourselves. There's, the, uh, there's a real-time clock, because unfortunately the, the Raspberry Pis don't keep time by themselves, so um, that's important to us, so we, we need something to do that for us when it's, the device is turned off. Uh, we also have a little microcontroller down there, um, and what that, it's used for two things. It's used uh, as, a, for a watch, as a watchdog, so that if something goes wrong on the Raspberry Pi and it doesn't check in uh, often enough with the controller, then the controller goes, oh, okay, something's gone wrong, kills the power, waits a few seconds and turns it back on again to let the system recover. But also the really important thing that that thing does is it can be told, turn the system off for eight hours and, and wake me up later, please. So we can uh, run our devices when they're on battery power, so they only turn on during the, during the night, they save power during the day, so it doubles our battery life basically, because the animals that we're interested in are mainly ac active at night anyway, so there's no point being awake during the day. So uh, running all this hardware is, uh, is challenging, um, making it all work. Um, and we've certainly learned a few things along the way. So one thing we learned pretty early on is that uh, putting electronics in the, the wild uh, is fraught with, with problems. Um, we struggled early on with, with waterproofing. So um, the, our very early prototypes used lots of silicon gel, which was really unreliable. Um, we lost quite a few devices in, after heavy rain, but we uh, we now have you know good quality seals on these enclosures. Um, we use weatherproof connectors like the one pictured there for any in, input and output, so for power and, and, and other uh, actuators. Um, I mentioned the the thing called a gore valve, which is this little um, lump on the bottom there. Uh, what that does is it allows pressure to change inside the case without uh, letting moisture in or out, and that's Super important because when it gets really hot and there's a lot of the sun on the case, uh, pressure builds up inside the case, the air inside wants to expand, which puts a lot of strain on the, the seals. And um, I mean, if, if that keeps happening all the time, hot, cold, hot, cold, the seals fail much more quickly. So it's super important. Uh, it's a really good lesson we learned from one of our partners. And um, we also just have, you know, uh, good old silica gel in there as well, just to deal with any moisture that was there when the case was closed. Uh, so a bit more about the camera. So it's a Lepton 3 from a company called Fleur. They're, they're quite good for the, for the money. Um, not super high resolution, but good enough for our application. But they do ask a lot of you if, as, as a developer. Um, 
So you have to do quite a lot of work and you have to make sure you can read that camera really fast, because if you don't read it fast enough, you lose sync with the camera and you start dropping, dropping frames. So we, we struggle with that quite a lot. And um, the, the way we ended up winning with this problem was switching to a faster programming language. We were using Python. Uh, Go was able to keep up much, much more easily. And also we moved the camera reading into its own process and gave that process real time, Linux real time priority. So it never gets interrupted. And as soon as we started doing that, their problems were over. So we've got this one process that's reading the camera as fast as it can, keeping up, and it's feeding that, the, the completed video frames out to something else where the, the fun stuff happens. Uh, we also struggled with battery power quite a bit. When we, you know, obviously our earth early prototypes were connected to mains, often with very long extension leads, you know, off people's properties, but that, that only gets you so far. Um, so we initially tried, you know, we, we tend to try off the shelf things if we can first. So we were using these USB battery packs and w applying some weatherproofing to them. Um, but the problem is they're all really smart or too smart. So uh, when the devices turn themselves off during the day, there's hardly any current draw. The battery pack says, oh, nothing's connected. I'll turn myself off and then they won't turn on again. So you need a person to come over and turn it back on, which is completely defeats the purpose. So we now have these beautiful custom weatherproof battery packs that get made. Um, one cable, not too smart, um, and yeah, no water can get in. So that's, that's fixed those problems for us. And now Claire's gonna talk about some of the data side of things. Okay, so um, thanks Mino. I'm gonna now talk about what we do with the um, thermal output that we see. And basically we go through different stages. And the first is motion detection. So we choose to do a different way of doing motion detection than the cameras, uh, trail cameras out there that a lot of people are using. We use camera um, and then we wanna take that further. We wanna know what we're seeing without a human looking at it. And we've used machine learning, but we actually break it up. So we first of all, because we're using thermal video, we find the animals using classical methods and then we, then we apply machine learning to it. So um, there's a lot of cameras on the market out there, um, mainly used by game hunters, and they're really good at animals like deer and big animals. But the animals we're looking at, stoats and, and rats, they tend to be pretty small and they tend to be pretty fast. So using um, a one sensor and then turning on the camera when you, you see an animal just doesn't work well, it doesn't catch enough animals in our environment. So we use the, the camera, and I'll have a wee look at that in a minute. So we're, we've got the camera always on, we're always looking at the camera feed, and then we detect when it's, it's got changes and they can be quite small. So this is, this is working really well for us. It's giving us a lot of information, but it is a lot more power hungry, and now that we've moved to battery power, that's, that's a something that we're, we're always wanting to improve on. And also we haven't fully dealt with the when it's windy. Um, so I've got some videos to show you the sorts of things. So this is a stoat. Um, if you missed that, I'll play it again. So this is about one second of footage. Um, a lot of the trail cameras, for instance, might take um, about half a second to turn on even just to take a still, and obviously it will have gone and we by then. Um, and on this picture, so if you just look at the circle, there is a small animal there. Um, that would not have been picked up on a trail camera, almost certainly. While this isn't giving us a lot of information on um, what sort of animal it is, if you were monitoring this, this is really useful information that there's animals out there. I mean, people quite often have traps and they're like, oh, you know, I have a trap, I put a camera on it, the bait disappeared, but there were no pictures. Um, and this is using trail cameras. So this has given them a lot more information that they didn't have that, yes, you have animals out there. And especially if you have a remote island that was, well, that is predator free, the sooner you can find an animal on it, the, the sooner you can, of course, eliminate it. And this is, this last one is um, wind. So uh, 
this is what we haven't learned to deal with yet. Um, if anyone wants to give me any, any advice, um, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, so if, if you just look at it, um, that's grass and that moving around on a windy day. We only, we only trigger on warm things moving, but often, if, especially at the end of a day when there's a tree that's warm from the, from the day, and you've got something cooler, like some leaves moving in front of it, that, that will look to the motion detector like, hey, something warm's moving around, let's start recording. So that's something we, we're still battling with. Yeah, and hedgehogs, for instance, aren't actually that warm. Like, if you get their tummy, they're quite warm, but um, their um, prickles aren't hugely warm. So they can quite quickly uh, be the same, look the same as, as, as vegetation moving. Now, at this stage, you know, we're like, oh, we've got to classify this thing, but actually we've already done an amazing job because we're giving people out there who are actually trying to kill cat pests the opportunity to see stuff that they've never seen before. And this is the sort of stuff we see. So this is um, quite early footage, and it's actually got the two cameras. And you can see that, oh, and this is actually an open trap. So we've found open traps are much more effective. That's the hedgehog. But the problem with open traps is you have to check them every day. So that's why they're not used by the majority of groups. And this, so that um, is the trip, trip plate, and you'll see this possum actually trips it and then gets away. These, these creatures can be super, super fast, especially the rats. Um, yeah, and this is a cat. There's bait it's playing with in this trap. I know that because, you know, you, when you set it out, you kind of can see it. <laughs> and one, thing, one thing worth pointing out here is that we've had to highlight where the trap is and, the, and everything because we're dealing with thermal vision, so it's yeah. night, the metal's all cooled down, so you can't actually see it. Only the, it's just showing you how the, the animals really do turn up. But people see these for the first time, and like, they like email us, and they're like, oh, you know, we saw this last night. And they're like, oh, I can't believe it, you know. And, and we're like, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, but it's so exciting. So you give, um, so we've got people at Living Springs, which is just over the hill, they're trying to create an eco-sanctuary. And you give them even the ability to look, and if it's triggering right, so they don't have to look through screeds of videos, you know, most videos have something interesting. They will start looking. They will start starting their day by going to our website and going, oh, I wonder what happened last night. <laughs> um, and they will tell you what happened and give you lots of feedback. And, and this is quite good. And they will tell you, <laughs> you when you're not doing it right as well. Like, how come I got something in my trap? But there's no footage. Um, and they will send you gruesome pictures of rats. <laughs> but um, this is, I, I, you know, I can't show you, but um, come afterwards if you want to see some pictures of rats, if that's your thing. So this in itself, even though we don't feel there, we're actually already given people tools that at the moment they don't have. And that's given them knowledge that they don't have, um, which on an aside can be quite an affronting thing because, you know, we get these groups who somehow think we're experts at trapping, which we're not. And they come up to us and they're like, oh, what bait do you use? And we're like, mm, well, actually, you know, the traps you're using are 1% effective. We don't say that. But, um, so it's, it's always an interesting engagement with the community, I think, because we're not quite ready to help to provide them with um, a, a finished product yet. OK, so the next stage, actually identifying the animals. Our goal is classification, so we want to know what animal we're seeing without having a person have to look through it. But what we do is, because so that we don't have to have so much data to train on, and to make sure that our, our learning system is focusing on the right things, is we actually locate the animals, we relocate the hotspots, and then we link them together in frames. Because with animals also, how they move is important. So. Rats and birds look quite similar, they're a similar size quite often, but birds will kind of 
jump from one spot to the other, whereas rats sort of tend to um, follow a more linear move, uh, movement speed. So um, this is a video of a possum coming out of a tree. So this is a really nice, simple case. And as it comes out of the tree, what we're doing is we're taking away the, the background noise. And that's what you see in the right top corner. And then what we basically try and do is make sure that we get a bit of a glob. And that's what this mask in, uh, down below is showing, how, how many pixels are bright enough that we think that that's most, or could definitely might be an animal. And so when we get enough pixels and the, there's several of them together, then we'll, we'll start doing, uh, believing that's the track. And if you look at the first um, frame at the top, you will see the square around it. And that means it's a track. Now, it's quite amazing because you can see quite well there. But actually, what the track looks like is this. So this is what we're doing our machine learning on. Um, which is not very high, high fidelity. So we're really hoping that Fleur come out with just a little bit better camera because that will let us see animals further away and identify them. Although they do tend to get hidden with foliage as well. Um, yeah, and this is, oh, I thought I made this a still. Um, so this is actually uh, the wind video you saw before. So here you've obviously got lots of different um, areas that could be tracks. And I turned up the, the sensitivity to make sure it looked even more impressive. So it's not always as simple as having one animal. It's definitely not as simple as having one animal and following it through the frames. Quite often there's separate tracks and some of them are just the background. Um, we still don't have our tracking perfect. Um, we've got issues with occlusion. So when something goes behind, um, and it gets chopped in half, it's not joining the two bits together, which probably makes more sense. And that's something we're working on now. So now we've got the tracks, we're going to move on to actually classifying them to an animal. So these are the main animals that we're interested in. That's uh, rats, so that's rats and mice. They don't, um, um, hedgehogs, um, birds. But uh, even though we're interested in birds, we're not, we're not looking at it from a biology point of view. So we actually have two classifications, birds and kiwis, because kiwis actually don't move like little birds. Um, then we've got that Ferny thing is, is um, a false positive, so that's where we store all the movement of, of trees and stuff. Um, unknown, I mean, that animal we saw in the distant side mark is unknown. Humans, we don't want to, don't want to maim humans. Um, <laughs> I, I think that would give us a bad reputation. <laughs> Cats, yeah, well, once we've got possums, Stoats and uh, rats, we'll, we'll, we'll walk, work on cats, but um, let, let's get the others because people are a bit passionate about their cats. Um, possums, of course, and then we have the mustard lids, um, stoats, weasels, and ferrets. ferrets. And again, stoats, weasels, and ferrets, like if you talk to someone on biology, they'll be passionate about it and then they'll tell you all the differences, but we can't tell, so again, they just get their mustard lids um, classification. But really, a lot of the time what we care, oh, and movement, so we, we want movement as part of the, uh, we want to see how these animals move because that's important, not just the pictures. Um, but really what we care about is um, more about, and especially I think what we'll care more about is whether it's a predator or an, uh, not a predator. And this, is, this starts to become interesting because rats and hedgehogs, for instance, quite often are quite hard to distinguish. But in a lot of situations, we don't care. Cats are the interesting one because sometimes we will want to get rid of cats, like in the bush in 
Um, but if we're near town edges, probably taking out people's oh. pit mog uh, moggies is not a, a nice way to uh, get friends. So this is what we're trying to achieve really is a classification primarily, you know, is this something that we want to get rid of or is it, is it one of our friends? Okay, so how we do the training is we take the recordings we've got and we label them. And actually we aren't labeling them, we know, quite as well as we want to because we're labeling the videos at the moment. We want to move to labeling the tracks because that will help our machine learning. And we take three second long segments and we take these pictures, however big they were, and put them into a four by, a 48 by 48 pixels. And then as per normal machine learning, we have a training set, a test set, and an evaluation set. So you do your training and you test how, how effective that particular model was against your test set. And then once you think you've got a nice machine learning model, you then test it against hopefully a completely new set called the evaluation set. And that will tell you whether, it, um, whether it's really generalized enough. So, I mean, in the beginning, for instance, we didn't have a lot of footage. All the possums were on a particular video climbing up a tree. It basically decided that anything with a tree in it was a possum. <laughs> So this would not generalize very well, and that, that's really what we're trying to do with the evaluation set. Now, we are always struggling a bit for data, so we also play around with what we feed into the testing. So we will um, crop it slightly differently. Um, we ch adjust the brightness of the images before we feed it into the machine learning with, with the labeled tag, um, yeah, and we flip it. And this can take around, with, with a GPU, so a fast computer, it can take around six hours So it, per training. So, you know, it, it's a sizable time, but it will, we'll just play around there. So we initially did this on someone's computer with a GPU. Um, more lately, we're, we're looking at using Google, Google Compute. So our model structure, um, just for those who are interested, um, we use technologies NumPy OpenCV. So that's more um, for extracting the tracks and then TensorFlow does machine learning. We have something called a recurrent conv convolutional neural network. And, and the main thing is that means that we have memory. So that gives us the movement. So we're feeding individual frames and classifying them, but then we're looking at how it varies between frames. So this is the results. We um, communicate them back in our initial videos. So when people look at their videos, they get all this information, which allows us to monitor it. Um, up the top, it, it talks about, that's the final classification. And then down here, um, it looks at what, at this point in time, when the machine learning's running frame by frame, this is what it thinks it is. And a novelty is something, oh, I'll have a quick talk about that later. So this is um, the possum video again with the machine learning now, and you can see that that 1.7 rat, it first of all thinks it's a rat. It's not very um, convinced it's a rat, and that's why it's got a question mark at the end, and then as it moves, it becomes it starts to understand, hey, this is actually a possum, and then it works. So you can see how that memory is really affecting um, the, what, it, what it thinks it is. Um, the main thing, problems we've had is garbage in, garbage out. So it's the quality of the videos that you're putting in. If you put one mislabeled video in or one, uh, it, um, or track, it can, it can actually get quite confused. And um, we've had trouble with quantity and diversity. So that tree problem came from the fact that even though we had quite a lot of video, it wasn't diverse enough. Um, and at the time, we didn't have enough cameras, so we used camera days to chop up the set, whereas really we need to use completely different camera views, so we need to look at different scenes to, to make that work. But 
a lot of the work really goes into this 80% of making sure you have somewhere to store the video, making sure you can tag it and all that stuff. Um, novelty is something that we're starting to work on. And the, the, we, we aren't convinced, but this is basically looking at how different is this to other examples that we've seen of this. Um, so that, yeah, when a, cause a person comes along, they don't get stuck in the trap. Um, and our next steps are, is really just improve on what we've got. Even we get lots, quite often in videos, we get lots of tracks. Even working out which ones are important is, is a, something that we can tweak. Um, we might want to move to dogs because I think they're a big risk, especially from a, you know, people who lose a dog, they're very, very passionate about that. Um, so we might need to do some training on, on dogs, even though we aren't looking for dogs. Um, and then, yeah, maybe we need a new model, which isn't for, for our traps when we want to decide whether we're going to open the trap or not, which is just simple. Is it, is it something we want to open for or is it something we don't? Um, yeah, and then we're running out of time, so I'm going to pass back to uh, Mino. Uh, okay, so we have a web application, uh, which we kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, I won't talk too much about that because of time, but this gives you some idea of, of what we, we see when we're reviewing videos and tagging. We've got buttons at the bottom to, to quickly apply tags, and um, it's for efficient scrolling. It's all about efficiency because uh, we've got so many recordings to deal with all the time that we put a lot of effort into making it really quick. And there's visualizations built in as well, so we can get an idea of what's been going on recently. Um, and there's also that uh, Sidekick, the Android application, which we uh, use for local management. It uses a local wireless connection. But again, I'll, I won't go too much into that. Um, so what are, where, where are we heading? Um, maybe we should mount cannons on top of um, Kias. I don't know. Uh, so a lot of what we talked about is about Identifying um, these pests in the wild, automatically classifying them, and that's great. Um, but right now, that's all running in the cloud. So for sites that are more remote, that's not practical. We can't keep uploading recordings. So one thing we need to do, and, and we're working on at the moment, is getting the machine learning model running on, on board with the camera. And, um, and we're, we're pretty confident we can do that. Um, and once we have that, um, then you've got a device which can be deployed and automatically um, tell you what's, what's going on in a particular area. I saw this many rats tonight, I saw this many possums tonight, I saw this many states, which is great. A lot of groups that are out there trying to clear predators from the, the native environments are telling us that just knowing what they're dealing with is, is a big deal. Um, and, and right now they don't, can't do that, especially for, for mustelids, for stoats and, and ferrets and weasels. Uh, another thing we're working towards is uh, creating what we call a cacophony index. So it's taking those audio recordings that we're making of birdsong and, and turning them into a, a score for a particular place, which you can then see over time and through seasons and years uh, whether uh, bird populations are going up or down. Uh, we're also uh, starting to experiment with audio lures. So there's been some research to suggest that uh, playing sounds can uh, bring some animals, especially possums, which are quite curious, uh, closer uh, to the source of the sound. Um, and so we, we've got a system in, in the works which will let you experiment with those and play sounds and schedules, play sounds at different volumes. And then over time, we should be able to figure out whether this actually does work and what kinds of sounds um, might attract um, animals. And that's really important because if that does work, it, it means you can deploy these devices much further apart um, and increases their effective range. And the other thing we're working on, which is really exciting, and uh, I can show you some of the work there, uh, is we're pairing the, so it's great that we can identify these things, but what about actually getting rid of them? And what, we, uh, what we're working on is uh, pairing the camera with a trap, but it's a different kind of trap, which we call an open architecture trap. So instead of being very um, sort of limited, or, you know, handicapped, if you like, um, in, in terms of what it can, uh, you know, having a very small hole or requiring the animal to stick their head into a particular space. Um, we're looking at traps that are open, all the doors, you know, are effectively open. And uh, the trap will only go off when we know there's an animal in, 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 the, in the right area and it's, uh, it's an animal that we want to get rid of. 
Um, so it's not a bird or something else, or, uh, or a small child. Uh, and then uh, we go, great, let's activate the trap. And then it can go and tell somebody, hey, the trap's gone off. So I'll just show you a demo of a very early prototype. Kind of, so as you can see, all the, door, all the sides are open, and bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, a lot of the stuff on the top is also about allowing it to open up again. So this is all stuff that's happening right now. Um, where, where, where might we be in five years? So <laughs> you joke, but this got us in the paper. Uh, <laughs> um, so we've, one idea that we definitely, uh, we've done some work on and we definitely want to do is, is pairing the camera with a, a, a turret, which has a, a paintball gun on it. And instead of the conventional paintball pellets, the, the paintball pellets would have a small amount of toxin in it. So the idea is anything that comes within, say, 10 meters of, of our device will get spotted. We point the turret at it, we deliver toxin, which breaks on their fur, and they groom, ingest the poison, and go off and die somewhere. So there's a lot of advantages. The big one being you don't have to rely on the animal getting to a particular place. You can be, you know, also, there's nothing to be cleared. There's no trap that an animal is, is inside that somebody has to get out. Um, it, it goes off somewhere and, 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 and dies without um, any sort of anything needing to be cleared. So it's, it's, it's certainly something, a compelling thing, but of course it relies a lot of work, extra work on robustness, reliability, and safety. And there's some legal approvals as well, um, being able to deliver a toxin in that way. Uh, but it, it's, it's something I think we, we are very interested in. Uh, Another thing that's been talked about uh, a little bit, we haven't done too much on, but people who, who are very, very good at drones have told us we should definitely be looking into it. We're not talking about shooting things from the air, but it's more about putting our, our system on a drone which can sit on a flat big truck. You might have 10 of them and you say, this, you go there, you go there, you go there. It flies out, sits there for a few days to, to a week until the battery runs out and it flies home again. So you can deploy these devices into remote environments where the people don't have to walk to. Um, and it just greatly increases the effectiveness of, of what we can do. And we've been told that uh, the technology for uh, flying through trees and, 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 and around obstacles is actually quite advanced these days. So even uh, forest canopies might be a, a doable thing. So that's it's certainly, it sounds very sci-fi, but actually might be something we end up doing. So as we mentioned, we're open source and we're always looking for help. So um, if you're interested, please let us know. Uh, we have small things. Cool. All right. I think we're out of time. So uh, I just put up the final slide. We've got tons of languages and stacks there to, to play with. So hopefully there's something there that you might know and be interested in. And that's where we can be contacted. The email address goes straight to the core development team. So. Awesome.